back to the minor prophets. Hosea 11 verse 9 says, I will not execute the fierceness of mine anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into the city. Okay, now you say, well, see, God can't be a man. Right there proves it. No, what that's saying is God says, I am God and not man. He's saying, What's it say? I will not execute the fierceness of mine anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim. In other words, he's saying, I'm not going to execute the kind of wrath that you would as a mortal man. That's why he's saying, he's saying, I'm God. I'm not like you. I'm not a man that I'm going to come down and just do this vengeance thing. I'm not going to react that way. That's all that verse is saying. I mean, think about it. What is God? God is a man. He is masculine. You know, he's not some kind of a sexless being that lives up in heaven or something like this. God is a man. But what he's saying in that verse is, I'm not going to react like a man would. I'm not going to react like a mortal man would. I should say it that way. So again, that doesn't disprove that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Another one that he quoted here was, um, well, here, let me, let me just show you this one. We'll go here quick. Isaiah chapter 55. To illustrate my point. Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Okay, a very familiar portion of Scripture. And again, it's illustrating this point. God is saying... I think differently than you do as a mortal man. Again, that's all that the verse there in Hosea 11 verse 9, that's all that that's saying. It's not saying that God never became man in the person of Jesus Christ. Another one that he quotes is Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 2. Let's look at that. Ezekiel 28 verse 2. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Okay, so you say, well see, right there again, it's debunking this thing of this man wanting to become God. Well, but you go on to study, in Ezekiel chapter 28, it's talking about Satan, the anointed cherub. So again, how can you compare Jesus Christ to Satan? You can't. So to use these verses to try and disprove that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh, um, sorry, that doesn't work. And then he quotes Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. Numbers... 23 and verse 19. Let's check something here real quick. Okay. Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Again, well, see, that proves that God can't ever be a man manifest in the flesh. No, it proves that God doesn't react the way a mortal man would react. That's all that's proven. This is not disproving Jesus Christ being God manifest in the flesh. And again, you know, let's go back to the, the basic premise of this whole thing. The Jewish Messiah is just going to be a, a mortal man, a, a human there. Uh, the Jewish Messiah will be, a, will be human according to this, um, this rabbi. Then how's he going to do everything that the Messiah is supposed to do when he comes? I mean, how's he going to get all nations to get along? How's he going to turn the people into one language? How's he going to rebuild the temple? How's he going to bring back all the cities? How's he going to get the animals to get along with the people? It just doesn't work. Okay, number two, the second objection that the rabbi brings up, he says, performing miracles 
the Jewish Messiah won't perform miracles. And then he has strike. So Jesus messed up there again. Oh, really? Let's go to Exodus. Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. Now, wouldn't that be something if you had a, this Jewish man shows up and he goes, I am the Messiah. Is, what are you going to do as, as the nation of Israel? Are you going to say, oh yeah, okay, he's, there's our Messiah right there because he said he's a Messiah. How is the man, how is the Jewish Messiah going to show that he is the Messiah? Unless he does signs and wonders. But look what the, what the Lord says to Moses here. You know, the writer of the Torah, you know? The, the greatest man there in, in the Old Testament, according to the Jewish people. Verse 2, And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. I agree with that. <laughs> and the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and called it, and it became a rod in his hand that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into, thy, into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again, and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh." And it, and it shall come to pass, if they will not hark, or not believe thee, nor neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river, and pour it upon the dry land. And the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land." And Moses, of course, performs quite a few other signs and wonders. But you see, the nation of Israel, as a political nation, where they're going out and they're conquering all these other countries and things like this, it begins with signs. So why would this Jewish rabbi say performing miracles, the Jewish Messiah isn't going to perform miracles? Well, I can guarantee you, if the Jewish, if the Jewish Messiah that you're expecting, that you're believing is going to come one day, if he can't perform miracles... He's not going to be able to be the Messiah because it's going to take a miracle to take over all the other countries and have all the other countries come to you and, and to be able to get the animals, the wild animals. Keep going back to that thing. The wild animals. How are you going to get the wild animals to get along with you, to get along with people and with one another? The lamb and the lion together and things like this. No prophetic significance there either. You know, the lamb that was slain coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah and Hmm. Just doesn't work. Number three, the Jewish rabbi says here, taking on the sins of others. No one can take on the sins of others. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16. Exodus 32, verse 30 through 35. Ezekiel 18, verses 1 through 4. 20 through 24 and 26 through 27. And then he has strike again. And so he says, Jesus took on the sins of others. And therefore, the Jewish, our Jewish Messiah that we're expecting, he can't take on the sins of others. You can't take on the sins of other people. So therefore, Jesus was the false Messiah. He was not a real one. He wasn't the real Messiah that the Jews are expecting. Well, again, let's go to the verses. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16. The first one that this Jewish rabbi stated here. Deuteronomy chapter 24. Deuteronomy 24, verse 16. The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Okay, what is the verse talking about there? I mean, what is the context? The context is talking about capital punishment. It's not talking about eternal salvation. All right? So, Using this verse to try and attack Jesus Christ and, and everything, it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. It's talking about capital punishment. 
This is not talking about, you know, I mean, you could have somebody that was saved and they killed somebody by mistake there in the Old Testament and, you know, they are put to death, but eternally, where are they going to go when they die in eternity? See, it's not talking about that. All right, as far as, uh, it's not talking about salvation here. It's talking about being punished. You know, obviously, if some kid goes out and, and kills somebody, you don't come and kill the father for it. You kill the son. That's what the verse is talking about. This has nothing to do with Jesus Christ dying on the cross to pay for your sins. It doesn't have anything to do with that. That's, next, let's look at easy, or, uh, excuse me, Exodus chapter 32. Next one that this rabbi quoted here, Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32, verse 30 through 35. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord peradventure. I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, O this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Hmm. Therefore, now go, let the, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. Wait a second. Why didn't God hearken to Moses? I mean, Moses is saying, hey, instead of punishing the people, you take it out on me. You put, you put all this punishment and everything on me. What did God say to him? The Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Why did God say that to Moses? Because he was illustrating a point to Moses. He was saying, Moses, you can't pay for the sins of those people. You want to know why? Because Moses was a sinner himself. You can't have a sinful man paying for the sins of other sinful people. The only way to pay for sins is to be sinless, like the Lord Jesus Christ was. That's what's going on there. Next, we'll go to Ezekiel uh, 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. And look at these other scriptures that this rabbi gave to prove that Jesus couldn't take sin on himself. Ezekiel 18, verses 1 through 4. Okay, it says here, The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge? As I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. You say, well, then Jesus couldn't have uh, paid for sins of man because the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Oh, uh, yeah, but you see, if you can get through that system without sinning, which Jesus Christ did, then uh, you can pay for the sins of other people. See, if you can offer yourself as a sacrifice to pay for sins and you yourself are sinless, then you can get through. Okay, that's why it works. That's how it works. Jesus Christ lived a perfect, sinless life and he died to pay for your sins. But hey, if you want to reject Jesus Christ and try to wait for a Jewish Messiah that can come, a mere mortal man that somehow lives sinless, and can somehow magically lead you into salvation, well, go ahead. I'm going to take the Lord Jesus Christ and go that way. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 18 through 24. It says here, As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed and spoiled his brother by violence, and did that which is not good among his people, lo, even he shall die in his iniquity. Yet say ye, why doth not the Son bear the iniquity of the Father? When the Son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely live. Interesting that uh, this rabbi said, you know, 
X, or Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 20 through 24. I wonder why he would leave out verses 18 and 19. Let's keep reading here. Verse 20 through 24. The soul that sinneth it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. Uh, in his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked sh should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness uh, that he hath done shall not be mentioned in his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. You say, oh, that's he talking about salvation, Brian. That's talking about eternal salvation. No, it isn't. Read verses 18 and 19. It's talking about oppressing other people sinning in terms of murdering somebody or, or whatever. Capital punishment is what's going on again here. Interesting that this rabbi would leave that out. Now look at verse 26 and 27. When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and dieth in them, for his iniquity that he hath done shall he die. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. You say, well then see, saving his soul, Brian, that's eternal. That's eternal. So therefore, you know, that proves that you can have eternal life by being a good person. No, because if you read the Old Testament, the soul and the body are connected. That's why it talks about touching things that are unclean and the soul is unclean as a result. The soul and the flesh are connected in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it teaches a circumcision made without hands. What is the circumcision? The spiritual circumcision in the New Testament is there is a physical circumcision, which is, you know, the Jews can still do and a lot of people still do, and that's fine for male children on the eighth day. You know, you can study that. But the spiritual circumcision is where the flesh and the body are cut loose one from another. So now if I touch something that's unclean, it doesn't affect my soul. Why? My soul has been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That's why my sins, past, present, and future, are paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, I believe it is, says that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. What do you have in the Old Testament like that? See? But again, these verses are talking about the death penalty. Here in Ezekiel chapter... Uh, 18 verses 26 through 27. See? Okay, and, you know, and he says about taking on the sins of others, that this is wrong and stuff, the Jewish Messiah is, you know, that's Jesus wouldn't qualify. Okay, what about the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament? The scapegoat and things like that. Wasn't that system of animal sacrifice about taking the animal taking on the sins of the people? You just reject that part of the Old Testament? Uh, number four, the Jewish rabbi brings up a point about Jesus breaking the Sabbath. And then he says, strike. The Jewish Messiah will be observant. Strike. Well, he got, you know, Jesus got two strikes on that apparently. Okay. Um, when did Jesus break the Sabbath day? And why didn't he give any scriptures? I'm going to show you why this Jewish rabbi did not give any scriptures. Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Let me show you one of these times when Jesus supposedly broke the Sabbath day, didn't keep the Sabbath day, according to the Jews that lived back then. Mark chapter 3, verse 1. And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand, and they watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him, like this rabbi just did, right here in this thing I'm reading. Verse 3, And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. 
And he saith unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. Very interesting. Because here we are in the year 2014, and you have the Orthodox Jews. Well, I assume this rabbi is an Orthodox Jew. I don't really know for sure. But you have an, a Jewish rabbi doing the same thing taking counsel, trying to destroy Jesus Christ, trying to destroy the credibility of Jesus Christ as the Messiah. When Jesus Christ broke the Sabbath, it was because he was doing good things for people. I mean, you get somebody that comes along and stuff like that, you're a Jew, and you see somebody trips and falls, and they, they're laying there and they can't get up, what are you going to do? Just stand back and say, I can't help you up. I'm sorry. Your grandmother walks into the room and she, she loses her balance and she goes to fall. Are you going to let her fall? You're going to run over and say, oh, I got you, Grandma. It's okay. It's all right. I got you. Are you okay? Well, that's what you do if you're sane. An insane person would just stand back and say, I cannot help my grandmother because that would be work. And she falls down, breaks her hip. You say, tough luck. Can't do anything for you. And Jesus was wrong because he broke the Sabbath day when he healed some guy's hand. Jesus wasn't just, you know, moving around saying, you know, I'm just going to stay here till, you know, for weeks at a time. Jesus was coming and going different places. He might not have met that guy again. You say, well, he could have waited another day to heal the guy. Why? Is it lawful to do right on the Sabbath day? Not a good point. Okay. The next point raised by the... Um, Jewish rabbi here, and we're not going to look up all these verses because, you know, this study is getting very long. But uh, a lot of scriptures to go over, just the way it works. Number five, uh, he says, Sacrificed rising from the dead. God rejects human sacrifice, and blood sacrifice is not an absolute requirement. <laughs> okay, blood sacrifice is not an absolute requirement. Um, it's all through the Old Testament. I don't know what you're talking about. But, uh, he quotes here Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 30 through 31, Jeremiah chapter 19, verses 4 through 6, Psalm 106, verses 37 through 38, Ezekiel 16, verse 20, Leviticus 5, 11 through 13, Jonah 3, 10, Leviticus 17, Leviticus 5, 11 through 13. He has that written twice there. I don't know why, but Numbers chapter 16, verse 47, Numbers 31, verse 50, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 6 through 7, Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 22 through 23, Psalm 51, 16 through 17, and of course he has strike at the end. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Jesus didn't strike out. You struck out there, Rabbi. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 30 through 31, Jeremiah 19, verse 4 through 6, and Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 20 through 21, are dealing with people sacrificing their children in fire. Um, that human sacrifice is wrong. But Jesus Christ dying at the hands of the Jews, they put him to death, they took him to the, to the Romans and said, you crucify him, you know, on the cross, which was a Roman form of crucifixion. That's not the same as human sacrifice going and saying, we're going to appease these pagan gods and stuff like this. The Jews sacrificed him because they didn't like him. They said it was blasphemy that he's trying to make himself God. That's why they killed him. You know, they crucified their Messiah. What you can read about that prophecy too, by the way, in the book of Daniel, talking about Messiah being cut off. You know, but not for himself. Another prophecy that Jesus Christ fulfilled the first time, by the way, I might add. Psalm 106, verses 37 through 38, deals with people sacrificing their children to false idols. Again, when the Bible's condemning that, it's not saying God is against that and God's also against his son dying on the cross to pay for your sins. Um, there were animals that were sacrificed in the Old Testament. Okay? And Jesus Christ is called the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Leviticus chapter 5, verses 11 through 13, deals with animal sacrifice to atone for sin, but they leave out verse 9. Very interesting. Um, because if you read, you know, he said about, you know, reading Leviticus chapter 5, verse 11 through 13. 
put it in there two, diff two different times, but he doesn't have you start back at verse 9. Here's why. Leviticus chapter 5, verse 9 says, And he shall sprinkle of the blood of the sin offering upon the side of the altar, and the rest of the blood shall be wrung out at the bottom of the altar. It is a sin offering. Blood as a sin offering. But the rabbi up here says blood sacrifice is not an absolute requirement. Well, it is according to Leviticus chapter 5, verse 9 that you conveniently left out. Jonah chapter 3, verse 10 says that God merely repented of the evil that he was going to do to the people of Nineveh. It doesn't say that they were saved eternally by their good works. Okay, Jonah comes, Jonah comes in there and he starts to preach to the people and they repent. And God says, okay, now I'm not going to destroy those people. But that doesn't mean that they were saved eternally. Leviticus chapter 17 proves blood sacrifice to atone for sin. Again, I don't know why he would put that in there. Leviticus chapter 17, you can read that chapter. We're not going to, like I said, for sake of time. Numbers chapter 16 verse 47 isn't dealing with eternal salvation, only stopping God's wrath on people. Again, you know, God doesn't have to have a blood sacrifice to pay for sins and stuff. You know, well, why would you quote Numbers chapter 16 verse 47 when it's just dealing with God punishing people there on the earth? not talking about eternal salvation. Numbers chapter 31 verse 50 is about the spoils of war and not about salvation from hell. Again, there were many times that you had people coming back in there and God saying, I want you to do this and this and that to keep my wrath from coming upon you. That doesn't mean that they're saved in eternity or lost in eternity. It's talking about right there on the earth when God was dealing with the nation of Israel, politically dealing with them, the kingdom of heaven as the New Testament talks about. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 6 through 7, another passage that this rabbi quoted here. Isaiah's sins were not taken away by this act of the angel putting a hot coal in his mouth. You know, okay? He says about your sins are, are you know, forgiven or whatever because he puts this hot coal in his mouth. But that doesn't mean that he was saved eternally. See, again, there are many places in the Old Testament where God tells somebody to do something to save them from punishment right there. But that doesn't have anything, any bearing on eternity. He's just saying, hey, get that thing cleaned up. You know, it's, it'd be like if I had a son and my son came in and I said, I want you to clean your room or you're going to get a spanking. Well, does that punishment that I'm going to give or reward that I'm going to give, does that have to mean whether or not my son's going to continue to be my son? No, it's just an immediate punishment for his actions in the current present time there. So again, trying to confuse those things with things that lead toward, towards eternity. Just, there's a good deal of dishonesty to be very honest with you here. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 22 through 23, God talks, or God tells them to walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you. This is a reference to the system of sacrifices and blood offerings. That's what was going on in the Old Testament. Take a lamb, take a this, take a that, and to bring it to the priest and sacrifices to make an atonement for your sins. Okay? It's all through the Old Testament. I don't know how you can't get that. Psalm 51, verses 16 through 17, David is referring to his own sacrifices and not the blood of Jesus Christ, which would make, which would one day make the final atonement for sin. Again, God is dealing with David and saying, take care of these sins here in your immediate time that you're in so I don't have to put out my punishment on you. But that was not saying... You do this special thing, and then that means you're going to be saved for all of eternity. Again, it hasn't proved a point there. But he said, blood sacrifice, this rabbi, he says, blood sacrifice is not an absolute requirement. Let's turn to two places here in the Bible. We'll see about that. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. Exodus chapter 12, verses 13 and 14 says here, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast 
to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast for by an ordinance forever. You remember that feast of the blood of a lamb being sacrificed. Hmm. Interesting. But the rabbi said blood, is, blood sacrifice is not an absolute requirement. It was right there for the Passover. What do you mean to tell me? You're going to celebrate the Passover and not tell people about the blood? It's supposed to be a perpetual observance there, the Passover. Hmm. What about that? Isaiah chapter 53 Isaiah 53, verses 5 through 9. You say, well, you know, I don't believe that there's any prophecies in the Old Testament saying that blood sacrifice has to be done to pay to atone for sin and things like this. You know, it's not an absolute requirement. Let's look about that. Isaiah 53, verse 5 through 9. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. You mean to tell me you can get stripes? whipped and there's no blood shed verse 6 all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned every one to his own way and the lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all he was oppressed and we and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter lining up with the passover and as a sheep before her shears is dumb so he openeth not his mouth he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? Why? Because he died. That's why it says, Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. He died. He shed his blood on the cross. Right there, Isaiah chapter 53. A prophecy of the Messiah to the Jewish people. Verse 9, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. And you're going to have a mortal man that's going to come in the future that's going to fulfill that, huh? Or, uh, well, that's the nation of Israel that fulfills that. Oh, really? Uh, he hath done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. You mean to tell me every Jew out there that this prophecy for the nation of Israel there, that there's no... Uh, Jews in the nation of Israel, that there's, uh, they all have perfect speech and language. Isaiah chapter 53 is about the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, and Jesus fulfilled that. It is not about the nation of Israel. That's ridiculous. Number six, the Jewish rabbi says, prophecies unfulfilled. The Jewish Messiah will accomplish them in one lifetime. Strike. <laughs> uh, chapter and verse. Where does it say that the Jewish Messiah will fulfill all prophecies in one lifetime? And by the way, you know, Jesus Christ, as God manifest in the flesh, he is fulfilling everything in his one lifetime. You know. But let's look here at Zechariah chapter 12. Turn to the book of Zechariah chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. It says here, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Okay, now is that the Messiah? Is this the Messiah? Is this a reference to the Messiah? Yes. Verse 10, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Prophecy of the coming Jewish Messiah. Now, if the Jewish Messiah didn't come the first time, how, when he comes back, are they going to say, look, up, look upon him whom they've pierced? Hmm. How about that? And again, it ties in with the other scriptures we were covering earlier there. Number seven, this Jewish rabbi says, being worshipped. Jews worship God and only God, strike and out. Uh, well, not a problem because Jesus Christ is God. So he is worthy 
of worship. So the Jewish rabbi struck out seven times. He didn't get any strikes at all on Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ beat all of those. Now in the, the last part here, last page of the notes, uh, this has been a long study, I realize, but like I said, there's a lot of scriptures that go over here. A lot of good attacks. Hey, a lot of these attacks are good points. If you were a lost Jew and you really didn't know what the New Testament said, I could see how you could see some of this stuff and get kind of confused. That's why I'm doing this study, and I'm doing this study in love. I'm not trying to attack you and put you down and, and call you a bunch of wicked satanic fools or anything. Not at all. I want to point you to your Messiah. And I'm going to show you, we're finally at the end now where I'm going to talk to you why no mortal man can be the Jewish Messiah. No mortal man can fulfill it. I'm going to show you that Jesus Christ is the only one that could fulfill it and did fulfill it. So finally, the Jewish rabbi says there are genealogical errors in Christianity. Okay, number one, he says, The Messiah is born of two human parents, as we said. But Jesus, according to Christian theology, was born of a union between a human woman and God rather than two human parents, as was Hercules, Dionysius, as well as many other pagan gods. Okay? Now, again, he is claiming here that there is scripture proof that Jesus or the, the, the Jewish Messiah has to be born of two human parents. Well, then why would he be called wonderful, mighty, the, you know, the, the mighty God, wonderful counselor, the mighty God? Why would he be called that? Hmm. But let me ask you a question. How could a mortal man redeem Israel? The perfect sacrifice to atone for sins must come through a sinless man, and only God himself could fulfill that role. Who out there can live a life without sinning? Only God could. And by the way, if a man sheds his blood to pay for your sins, wouldn't that blood be corrupted? Unless that blood came from God? Unless it was God's blood? Hmm. Number two, the Jewish rabbi says, the Messiah can trace his lineage through his human biological father back to King David. There's a problem with this. We'll see this in a minute. Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 10. Jeremiah 23, verse 5. Ezekiel 34, verse 23 through 24. 37, 21 through 28. Jeremiah 30, verse 7 through 10. 33, verse 14 through 16. And Hosea 3, verses 4 through 5. But Jesus' lineage cannot go through his human father, according to Christian theology, as Jesus' father was not Joseph, the husband of Mary, according to Christian theology. Jesus' father was God. Okay, um, now again, I have to challenge this Jewish rabbi. Where in the Bible does it say, come right out and say, that the Messiah is going to have a human father? It doesn't. That's an outright lie. Let me show you a verse that disproves that whole thing. Isaiah chapter 7, Isaiah 7 verse 14 and 15. Okay, Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Another prophetic reference to the coming Jewish Messiah. He needs to be born of a virgin. How are you going to do that one? How can a virgin conceive? Hmm, that's a problem. And of course, a lot of these, you know, Jewish rabbis and things like that, they'll go with the new virgin reading that says a young woman shall conceive. They won't, they'll take out the word virgin. Even though that's not supported by the text. But that's another issue. Okay, number three. And again, you know, let me just say this. You say, well, I do believe it is just a young woman and stuff like this. Well, then why even write a verse like that? If it's just a young woman conceives and brings forth a son, why put that into the Bible? It, uh, don't all women conceive, you know, and, and bring forth sons? Why write a thing like that? Hey, the Jewish Messiah someday is going to come from a woman. <laughs> wow, what a, what a prophecy. No, the prophecy there is an amazing prophecy because, and the, you know, it says the Lord himself shall give you a sign. What's the sign? A woman's going to have a child. 
Isn't that going to be a little hard to pinpoint who it was? How many women have children every day? How do you pick out which one is the Jewish Messiah? Not a very good sign from God. But it would be a good sign if a virgin will conceive. Oh boy, that would be a very good sign. And it already happened. And there's a reason why it happened too, by the way, which we're getting to. Okay, number three. The third point. The Messiah traces his lineage only through King Solomon, according to 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 through 17, 1 Chronicles 22, verses 9 through 10. But according to Luke chapter 3, verse 31, Jesus was a descendant of Nathan, another son of King David, and not a descendant of King David through King Solomon. Okay? Now, here's where it starts to get interesting. Turn in your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 22. Jeremiah chapter 22. Because I'll tell you right now, at the, at the beginning, you look at this thing and you go, yeah, how does that work? The Jewish Messiah is supposed to come down through from King David through King Solomon down through that bloodline. But according to Luke chapter 3, Nathan is the one that's coming down through. David, Nathan, and down through to Mary, to her family. Hmm, that's a problem. No, it isn't. Actually, I'm going to show you that it's a problem if you are saying that it, the Messiah has to come from King Solomon. I'm going to show you this. Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 24 through verse 30. As I live, saith the Lord, though Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, was the signet, were the signet upon my right hand, yet would I pluck thee thence. Who's Coniah? Well, God just renamed a man. See, his real name was Jeconiah. But God wanted that that first part of the word there, Je, kind of like Jehovah. You know, He took the Je off. Also, like Jesus. Interesting. You know, so God says, "I want that J and the E taken off there." So I'm just going to call you Kaniah. You're not Jeconiah. You're Kaniah. And God says, "Would I pluck thee thence?" Whoosh, pulls him out of that position. Verse 25, And I will give thee into the hand of them that seek thy life, and into the hand of them whose face thou fearest, even into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hands of, hand of the Chaldeans. And I will cast thee out, and thy mother that bare thee, into another country where ye were not born, and there shall ye die. But to the land whereunto they desire to return, thither shall they not return. Is this man Kaniah a despised broken idol? Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Wherefore are they cast out, he and his seed, and are cast into a land which they know not? O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Uh-oh, problem. You see, Coniah, there, I'm not even going to call him Jeconiah, Coniah sinned before God and God said, I cut him off. And now no more of his seed is any more going to sit on that throne of David. Oh, now how are you going to do this one? If you're a Jew and you're waiting for your Messiah and you're insisting he has to come down through that line, what are you going to do about these verses? God just broke it off. Oh boy, now what? Hmm, God broke off that line. So your Messiah can't come from King David through King Solomon down through. Why? There's been a break. God just cut it off. You say, well, then how does this work out for anybody? We're going to see. Number four, the Jewish rabbi says, the Messiah cannot trace his lineage through Jehoiakim, Jeconiah, or Shealtiel because this royal line was cursed. 1 Chronicles 3, verse 15 through 17, Jeremiah 22, verse 18 and 30. But according to Matthew 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, and Luke chapter 3, verse 27, Jesus was a descendant of Shealtiel. Now, I don't know where on earth he's getting this name Shealtiel because you look it up, the word Shealtiel, spelled 
S H E A L T I E L, excuse me, is found nowhere in Matthew chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, or Luke chapter 3, verse 27. Shield tail is not in there. I don't know where on earth he got that. But the maybe he meant to write Salath, Salathiel. Okay. S A L A T H I E L. Look it up in your King James Bible. Salathiel is the name. He was the son of Jeconiah, later known as Kaniah. Okay. Let's look at 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 17. First Chronicles chapter three. First Chronicles chapter three, verse seventeen, and the sons of Jeconiah, Aser, Salathiel, I guess it'd be how you say it, Salathiel, his son. So it's not Sheol Teal. I don't know where on earth he got Sheol Teal. But you see there, Salathiel is the son of Jeconiah. Now, is there a man named Salathiel in the genealogy of Mary slash Jesus in Luke chapter 3? Let's go to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. And this rabbi said uh, verse uh, 27. So let's look at that. Luke chapter 3, verse... 27, which was the son of Joanna, which was the son of Risa, which was the son of Zerubbabel, which was the son of Salathiel, which was the son of Jeconiah. Oh, no, wait, it doesn't say that. It says, which was the son of Neri. You say, oh, this must be an error. No, it's somebody else named Salathiel. It'd be like me saying, every man named Mordecai is evil and wicked. Well, I'm sure that there's more than one uh, Mordecai among the people of Israel today. Uh, that's a very common name for Jewish males. And right here you have a name Salathiel, but it's not the same Salathiel that was the son of Jeconiah. You say, well, then there is no Salathiel, the son of Jeconiah in Joseph's line. Let's look about that. Matthew chapter 1, verse 12. Keep your hand here in Luke chapter 3. But go over to Matthew chapter 1, verse 12. Matthew chapter 1, verse 12. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Salathiel, and Salathiel begat Zerubbabel. So in Matthew chapter 1, Salathiel is the son of Jeconiah, spelled Jeconias. Luke chapter 3. Salathiel is the son of Neri. They're two different Salathiels. They're two different men. They're not the same. So, Joseph, in his genealogy, he has that cursed line. Mary, in her genealogy, there's no curse. You say, but Brian, I don't understand how this all works out. Well, I'm going to read here from the commentary of Dr. Peter S. Ruckman, the commentary on Luke. This thing just came out not too long ago. And I'm going to read, read this because this really sums it up, I think, very well. He says here, okay, problem number one, Joseph is descended from Kaniah, according to Matthew chapter 1, verses 11 through 16. Okay, so that's a problem. Problem number two, God promised David that his seed would rule on his throne over Israel forever. So there's a promise from God there. So how does this work out? Problem number three, how can Jesus Christ claim the throne of David if he is the literal son of Joseph? Answer, he can't. Now see, here's the whole issue. And I'll ask this to you if you're Jewish out there. How can you have a mortal man claim the throne of David if he's a physical descendant through King Solomon? You say the Messiah is going to be a mortal man. How can he be? He's coming from a cursed line. Jeconiah. When Jeconiah becomes Kaniah and God says, I'm cutting you off. Nobody, your seed is never going to sit on the throne of David. Boom, you're done. You're finished. 
How then can you look for a human, you know, human mortal man there? How can you look for a mortal man being your Messiah? It's not possible. You say, well, then I don't understand this thing about Jesus Christ. How does this work out? Let's continue reading. Here's the solution. Jesus Christ is born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, 14, like we read about, from the house of David, with God as his father, so that he can bypass the curse placed on the descendants of Jeconiah. As the adopted son of Joseph, he can claim the legal right to the throne through Solomon as an actual son of David through Mary. He can claim the covenantal right to the throne because he's not under the curse of Jeconiah. Problem solved. You get it? If Jesus was a physical descendant of Joseph, then that seed that he gets from his father would be cursed. The cursed line that comes from Caniah. So he couldn't be the physical son. But he's an adopted son, so he's in that bloodline that comes down through. But his seed comes from God the Father. But his mother establishes his genealogy that goes back to King David. So he can still be the son of David. And he can claim the right to the throne through King Solomon because that's his adopted father. But yet his seed comes from God. Incorruptible seed. Now, you say, well, okay, yeah, you worked that whole thing out and everything, but we still believe in a mortal man being the Messiah for the Jews. Well, let me just say this with all Christian charity. Good luck finding one that can meet the requirements. You're not going to. No man of the seed of Israel, the nation of Israel, no man, mortal man, can claim the true right to be the Jewish Messiah. It's not possible. Only Jesus Christ can claim that right. Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. He is the Messiah for the Jewish people. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. He's my God. And I know the prophecies that are in this New Testament. And if you're in a system that tells you that you're not allowed to read this New Testament and that you should disbelieve this New Testament and the New Testament has contradictions, I'd get out of that system. You say, well, Brian, it's going to cost me family. It's going to cost me all kinds of things. I mean, and I know, I know. I know it costs something to be a saved Jew, to become a Christian, because that name Christian is hated among Orthodox Jews. And for good reason, like I've said, you know, it, it's just like, you know, among Bible-believing Christians, we don't like the name Catholic because we know what it means. And see, the Catholics take the name Christian. They've stolen the name Christian. They've never been Christian. If a Catholic becomes a Christian, they leave. <laughs> they get out of Catholicism. But what I'm trying to get you to realize is you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Messiah. He fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies with His first coming, and He'll complete them in the second coming. And these teachings, these attacks by this Jewish rabbi, they don't disprove Jesus Christ being the Messiah. And they basically have put you into a system of works for salvation and you are hoping to one day meet a man that can fulfill the Old Testament prophecies in his lifetime and it's not possible. It is impossible. If your hope is in a man coming to be the Jewish Messiah and you reject Jesus Christ, let me just say you are living a fantasy. There can be no mortal man that can fulfill all the Old Testament prophecies in his one lifetime. That's not possible. It is completely impossible. Why? Because he can't be a descendant of King Solomon coming down through. He can't be. Why? God cut it off. Why did God cut it off? So that you would be pointed to God being manifest in the flesh. The only man that could possibly take away your sins and redeem Israel. Which is going to happen. And you say, well, Brian, I just, I'm still not convinced. I just don't think that you're right. I think that you're lying. I have all these other questions. Um, you're always going to have questions. 
and you can go on and question what about this and what about that what about this verse here and how does this verse line up over here and how does this verse line up over there what about this verse in the new testament how does it line up over here question 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 it's going to get to the point point where you're going to have to come to the lord jesus christ by faith and you know there's a good acronym for the word faith that acronym is forsaking all i trust him mm -hmm. that what that's what it means to get saved you don't care what your family thinks anymore you don't care about not fitting in at the synagogue or or uh losing your job or everybody turning against you i mean I, you know i'm reading this book right here this jewish book of why and they talk about that there are actually funerals that they'll have for children that leave judaism they'll actually have a funeral service and say my son my daughter whoever they're dead it's just like dying and the whole family turns against you i heard a story the one time of a young man a jewish man you know pure pure blooded jew and he got saved and his uncle hunted him down and shot him a gun walked right into the you know little building where they were meeting and stuff like that assembling and, and he walked in shot him Flesh and blood uncle shot his nephew. Yeah, I know it's going to cost you something to get saved as a Jew, but you better do it. You say, well, am I going to get another chance if I, if I don't get saved and, and things? and, and this, Because you know, the next event is going to be the rapture, the taking away of the body of Christ. We're going to leave, and then you're going to get the punishment of God for rejecting Jesus Christ. You say, oh, then I can, I can believe at that point in time. Yeah, but then you're going to have to die as a martyr. And if you don't believe, you know, and stuff like that, well, you're going to get to see Moses and Elijah. They're going to come back, the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. Again, getting ahead of myself here a little bit, but the flag of Jerusalem has the line of the tribe of Judah and two olive branches. On either side, the line of the tribe of Judah comes down like that. And the western wall, the wailing wall there in the background of the flag of Jerusalem. The two olive branches there represent the two witnesses that are going to come in the book of Revelation the official flag of Jerusalem, and it's prophesying the future. The two witnesses come to bear a record of the line of the tribe of Judah in the middle. God's got it all worked out. And you can accept Jesus Christ now when it's easy to do that, and all you're going to get is your family going against you. But if you reject Jesus Christ and you miss the rapture, you aren't part of the body of Christ, you don't go up with the Christians, if you miss that, you are going into the time of Jacob's trouble. And then it's not only going to be your family that will turn against you, it's going to be the federal government. And the federal government in that day and age is going to be a worldwide dictatorial superpower with the Roman Catholic Church running the thing. And if you want to know what they've done, look at the Nazi Holocaust. Look at Fox's Book of Martyrs. Look at the things that the Catholics have done to people, dissenters, so to speak, down through the centuries. You want to go through that? I don't. That's why I got saved. That and the fact that I'm a sinner. And I know that there's nobody that can atone for me. There's no mortal man that can atone for me that can say, Hey, God, I paid for him. I did good things for him. No, the only one that can do that for me is God himself, manifest in the flesh, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, but Brian, I have other questions. I have other, I have other things that you didn't answer. There were other points and things. And, you know, I get this stuff all the time. What about this? What about that? What about this? Hey, man, what about salvation? Do you really believe that you can work your way into heaven? Do you really believe that when you stand before a holy, righteous, perfect God, that you'll be able to stand before him and he'll say, you were a pretty good person. Your good works outweigh your bad works, so I'm going to let you into heaven. You really believe that? Do you really believe you have a chance at talking God into being, you know, merciful to you because you've been a uh, good person? Do you really believe that? I don't. If I had to stand before God and give an account for my works, I'd go to hell like a bullet. Faster than a bullet. I'm not trusting in my own self-righteousness. I put my faith in the righteousness of Jesus Christ and the blood that He shed you know, the blood that atones for sin, the perfect blood. That's where my faith is resting. Let's close with a word of prayer. 
Dear Father God, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you that you sent your son down here to die on the cross. It was you that was manifest in the flesh. It wasn't uh, some other God or some other being or something. It was you. You came down here. You lived among people. And you chose the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, to bring salvation to all men. And I thank you, Lord, for that great sacrifice that you paid for us, the blood that was spilled to atone for our sin. And I thank you, Lord, that we don't have to try to be justified anymore by keeping the law and the torment that that would be of constantly breaking the law and trying to find ways to atone for that and everything else, Lord, and, and trying to have a son so that when we die we can have our son pray us out of hell. and What a horrible system of torment. I thank you, Lord, that you came down and paid that price so that we can know for sure that we are going to heaven when we die. And Lord, I pray if there are any Jews out there that are listening to this, that they would realize, that they would study the Scriptures and search the Scriptures and realize that you, that you did fulfill many parts of the prophecies of the Messiah and that the rest of them will be fulfilled at your second coming. I just pray for that, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would soften the hardened hearts and, and lift the blinders off of the eyes of the Jewish people, Lord. Uh, that time is coming, Lord. I can, I can sense it. I know the body of Christ can feel it too. We know that the time of Jacob's trouble is rapidly approaching. And our time to witness to these Jews and to try and get some of them saved, that time is fast disappearing. Lord, I pray for those Jewish people. I pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Lord. And I know that that peace can only come when you return. And, then, and before that, Lord, it's going to be horrible for those people. And that's why I'm praying, Lord, that there are some that might get saved before that time has to come. And I ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I do hope that you're going to get saved if you're a Jew. I care very, very much for the Jewish people. I'm not one of the Christians that's persecuted you. I'm not one of the Christians that tortured you and that tried to steal your country from you. I support the nation of Israel. I pray for the peace of the nation of Israel. So that's going to be it. Um, you're just going to have to come by faith. You cannot keep saying, well, I need this question answered and I need that question answered. And I you're playing with fire. You are playing with fire. I've showed you enough scriptures in this study to show you that Jesus Christ is your Messiah, that He did fulfill those passages of scripture. You say, well, I'm still not convinced. Well, then you're probably going to be heading into the time of Jacob's trouble. Then you're going to get to see Moses and Elijah physically over in the streets of Jerusalem proclaiming the word. You're going to get to see 144,000 Jews sealed. You're going to get to see signs and wonders the likes of which you haven't seen in, since Moses and Elijah were on the earth. You're going to get to see a lot of things in that time. But the Bible also says that men's hearts will fail them for fear. You're also going to see horror and terror like you've never experienced. And the chance of you making it, not very good. Get saved today.